So now we want to take our Phillips curve and our expectations augmented Phillips curve and think about the level of unemployment that is associated with no change in inflation, right? And this is going to be important, especially when we think about monetary policy, because the Fed is balancing full employment with stable prices. And we already saw that if you try to get the unemployment rate down to zero, then inflation is not stable, right? Prices are not stable. So the Fed has to decide, all right, well, what's the, the level of the unemployment rate that is consistent with uh, stable prices or with sort of constant inflation, right? And so if inflation is 2% and the unemployment rate is 5%, okay, maybe the Fed says, all right, we can live with that. Um, but we need to think about what our model says uh, about that level of the unemployment rate. And we're going to call that the natural rate of unemployment. And I don't love the term the natural rate of unemployment, although the next term we're going to use is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which is probably worse. Um, but what we want to think about is, well, where does that natural rate of unemployment come from? Um, is it changing? Do we see it in the data? Um, and you know, when someone says that they've estimated the natural rate of unemployment, I think it's important to think about how they did that, right? A lot of times when I see estimates for the natural rate of unemployment, it's just like taking a long run average of the unemployment rate. And so like it went up in the financial crisis and it would go up in the COVID pandemic. And it's like, well, no, nothing changed in the economy. It's just we're in a you know, deep recession for various reasons. So the natural rate of unemployment wouldn't have changed. So we're gonna start with equation uh, 8.3 here, right? So we said inflation is equal to expected inflation plus M plus Z minus alpha UT. And we're gonna say, all right, well, what if inflation is equal to expected inflation? Then uh, the left-hand side, you know, we can move this over here, uh, expected inflation to the left-hand side, that becomes zero. And then we can solve for the unemployment rate. So this would give us the unemployment rate when inflation is equal to expected inflation. And so we just move the alpha UT over to the left-hand side and divide everything by alpha. We get the natural rate of unemployment is equal to M plus Z divided by alpha. Now, those are all just sort of constants or coefficients in our model, right? M is the markup. Um, so this says a higher markup leads to higher natural rate of unemployment or less competition in the economy leads to more uh, unemployment. Uh, Z is our catch-all term, so that's not super useful. I mean, we can think about it as like things like unemployment benefits and the minimum wage, um, but then you're going to be kind of assuming that those things lead to higher unemployment, and that's really something that we should try to measure. And then alpha is our term that we, you know, estimated from the regression. Um, where does that come from? Well, I think that's a debate, right? I think, you know, where that coefficient comes from is probably pretty important, uh, but not necessarily completely clear. So then we can take uh, equation 8.3 and basically plug in our value for um, the natural rate of unemployment. Uh, and, you know, so, what we're doing here, so the first step we're doing is we're basically just factoring out a, a negative alpha, right, from 8.3. And so there is no alpha in M plus Z, so we have to put one in the denominator. And since we're factoring out a negative alpha, the UT becomes positive and the M plus Z becomes negative and has an alpha in the denominator. Well, M plus Z over alpha is just the natural rate of unemployment. So then we substitute in equation 8.8 .8 into here and we get equation 8.9. So what does this say? So this is, this is kind of an important uh, change in, our, in the way we think about the Phillips curve. It says the difference between actual inflation and expected inflation is equal to negative alpha times the difference between the actual unemployment rate and uh, the natural rate of unemployment. So if the actual unemployment rate is higher, then this term in parentheses is positive. We multiply it by negative alpha, that becomes negative, and inflation is lower than expected. If the unemployment rate is lower than the natural rate, which it can be, uh, then 
that's negative in the parentheses. So we multiply it by a negative that becomes positive and inflation is higher than expected. So we still have that same relationship um, between inflation and unemployment, but we're thinking about it differently, right? The key here obviously is when unemployment is equal to the natural rate of unemployment, the term in parentheses becomes zero. So the whole right hand side becomes zero and the difference between inflation and expected inflation therefore is zero, right? Inflation is exactly equal to expected inflation. So if we can use adaptive expectations and expected inflation is equal to last year's inflation, then we can just plug that in and we get the following result where if the unemployment rate is less than the natural rate, then inflation this year is higher than last year. And if the unemployment rate is greater than the natural rate, then inflation is less uh, than inflation last year. And so this is why we get this term, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment for the natural rate or, or NERU. Uh, again, that's not a great term. Economists aren't very good at naming things. Um, but then what this says, I mean, the, the takeaway here is that if you try to keep the unemployment rate below the natural rate, then inflation is going to keep going up. Um, it's going to accelerate, right? Although you could say it's really just, you know, the velocity is increasing or is staying constant, right? So, but you're getting farther and farther away from where you want to be. Um, do we see this in the data? Not recently, right? We haven't really had accelerating inflation, despite the fact that we have had periods of very low unemployment. So either this theory is wrong or the natural rate of unemployment is quite low or something has changed in the relationship between the unemployment rate and inflation over the last, you know, 40 years. So all of those are possibilities. So this is, as I said, I think in the last video, this is one of the few times when economists really sort of got something right. Um, they, these guys list Milton Friedman and Edmund Phelps. I think Modigliani is also in there. Um, and they said that this trade-off between inflation and unemployment was an illusion and that uh, it would disappear. And in fact, it did disappear, right? Usually economic theory is trying to catch up to the facts. So when you think about the financial crisis, we didn't really have a great role, uh, understanding of the role that financial institutions played in the macro economy. And so a lot of macro theory has been sort of putting that, you know, into our, our understanding. Um, but this is one of the times when uh, we were actually correct and it was, you know, in the 1970s where this really fell apart. And it fell apart both because expectations increased and then, of course, we had a lot of crazy things going on in the 70s, uh, including the, the oil crises uh, after the formation of OPEC um, and all of the Arab-Israeli wars. So we said we the we said the best relationship between unemployment and inflation in the united states today is where we graph the unemployment rate on the horizontal axis and the change uh, in the inflation rate on the vertical axis now one thing that we could do um, is to actually measure expected inflation um, unfortunately that can be difficult to do there is one way to do it um, that the market you know is sort of giving us a, an expected inflation measure if we measure the difference between the nominal interest rate on say a one-year treasury bill and the interest rate on a tips uh, bill which is a treasury inflation protected security and the idea with those is that they pay a real interest rate plus whatever inflation happened to be and so the difference between you know the nominal treasury bill and the tips treasury bill should be a measure of expected inflation Unfortunately, that data doesn't go back very far. Tips are a relatively new phenomenon, um, but we could use that um, as a measure of expected inflation. Um, and so that, would, that might be an interesting project to do. Um, so one of the things that we want to also think about is that whether or not sort of the natural rate of unemployment is the same for different countries or different times. Um, and the answer is, is pretty clearly no, right? Um, I think we could certainly argue that the, the natural rate of unemployment for the United States was higher in, um, say, the 1970s than it is today. And a lot of that has to do simply with demographics. Um, so, you know, if you think about when are people more likely to be unemployed, well, they're more likely to be unemployed when they're young. Uh, 
the baby boomers were young in the 1970s and 1980s. Now they are sort of entering their, you know, 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and they're more likely to be employed and or retired. And so that's going to push the unemployment rate down. Um, it's also important to think about labor market rigidities, right? And so how easy it is to hire people, how easy it is to lay people off, um, whether or not there are wage restrictions. Um, although, you know, it's, there are lots of possible ways, right? So Germany, for instance, had fairly high unemployment. They, they definitely reduced some of their labor market rigidities, but I would say compared to the United States, uh, it's still more rigid and they have a very low unemployment rate right now. Um, so these labor market rigidities can be important, but we ne shouldn't necessarily think that they're all of equal value, right? We need to measure which ones are more important. So, you know, one of the things that we want to think about is like the difference between the US and different countries in Europe. And now, as I said, unemployment rate in Germany is very low. The unemployment rate in Spain is very high. Um, and so looking at the differences there, I think is important. Um, they talk about some of the labor market rigidities that the book thinks is important, right? So generous system of unemployment insurance, high degree of employment protection. So it's hard to be fired or laid off. Um, maybe higher minimum wages, although that's more true in some countries than other countries, um, and maybe bargaining rules, you know, things uh, where unions are much more powerful. Um, and in Europe, you know, unemployment was not always high. It's not high in all countries now, right? In the 1960s, it was quite low. Um, and really one of the things that is true is that some countries like Spain, like Greece, like Italy, definitely suffered more in this financial crisis uh, than other countries. Um, and so that's been one reason that they've had such high unemployment. Although I think, you know, why have they not recovered as quickly as other countries is a reasonable question that we have to ask. So this, these are the unemployment rates in 2006. Um, so you can see uh, this was really before the financial crisis. So France and Spain had the highest unemployment rates, you know, between eight and nine percent. And then, you know, the more Nordic countries um, and some of the others had fairly low unemployment. So Denmark was around four percent. Germany was actually pretty high. Right. And so this is one of the reasons that they pushed through some of those labor market reforms. And now Germany is quite low. So. If we think about the change in the U.S. natural rate of unemployment, one of the things, you know, I already talked about the changing demographics, right, from uh, as the baby boomers uh, aged, they became a demographic, a young demographic that was more likely to be employed to an older demographic that was less likely to be employed, and they make up a large percentage of the population. Um, increased globalization, uh, I think, is definitely important. Uh, so. There's stronger competition between the U.S. and foreign firms. That's lowered the markup. That's increased competition um, in the economy in general. Um, we have more temp agencies, more ways to find jobs, even if they're not always great jobs. Um, and so that can reduce the unemployment rate. Um, and increasing the incarceration rate is as possible, right? So uh, the black population has always had a higher uh, unemployment rate. And I think that can be, you know, put down to discrimination. It can be put down to uh, the fact that they generally get worse education. Um, and so um, the fact is that we've locked up too many um, black people in general, black men especially, um, and that may have decreased the unemployment rate. Um, and then there has been an increase in the number of workers on disability. Um, and so the rules are such that if you work uh, while you're collecting disability, there's, you can't make very much money and still collect disability. Um, so it's not a great system uh, in terms of encouraging people to get off disability and to work or just to work in general, right? Some people who are on disability, they have huge costs associated with their disability. And so they need help from the government, from Medicare. And even if they would like to work, they can't because then they'll lose those benefits and it just doesn't make sense for them. 
So here we can look up at some, these are some updated European unemployment rates. Um, so the, the high line is Spain, right? So Spain has definitely had the weakest labor market uh, recently. But you can see, you know, they were all sort of in that, they, a lot of them were, were sort of in that sort of 10 percentage range around 2006, as we saw in that previous graph. Um, France is still fairly high. Germany is quite low. The UK is quite low. They're both below 5%. Um, and France and Italy are the, uh, the red and the blue lines, and they're sort of both around 10% right now. And, you know, the US, pre-COVID, obviously, uh, and this does capture some of the COVID uh, response here, um, pre-COVID, the US was around 4%, a little bit less. Uh, and now, of course, where we're sort of recovering from COVID, but not there, we're around 6.3% in the US. So we would be uh, somewhere between uh, the UK and Germany and France and Spain.